this is Heart Rhythm TV. Welcome back to the Ice Image of the Month. I'm Dan Aliesh. This is part two of the ice and ventricular anatomy, gross anatomy comparison with Dr. Sam Asservatham of the Mayo Clinic in Rochester. Welcome. Thank you, Dan. So in our part one, we looked at some critical structures in the outflow tract, uh, the anteroposterior relationships, the coronary vessels, the appendage, and the pulmonary trunk. Just focusing on some other key areas where VT ablation is not only facilitated, but sometimes really allowed only when we have real-time visualization of our catheter and the critical structures. One is the papillary muscles and the support apparatus for the mitral valve. Very complex structure, interdigitating, sometimes very difficult just to use standard nomenclature on which papillary muscle is which. Strands that could be caudal or could be Purkinje-like fibers that bridge the papillary muscles to the free wall to each other and to the septal components of the conduction system. Now to visualize the papillary muscles, it's good to look specifically at the left ventricle, which is posterior to the right ventricle. So getting an anterior position of the ice probe, for example, in the proximal outflow tract or in the bundle of his region, and then torquing the ice probe in a way that you know, in a plane below the plane of the aortic valve. That's a plane that we uh, explored in more detail in part one, but you're below, more inferior, more caudal to that plane, but also directing your V posteriorly to look at the posterior wall. In such a view, you can get an idea of how complex contact can be catheter and the pulmonary uh, and the papillary muscles. Now contact force with most of our catheters will tell you contact, but in specific directions, perpendicular orientation, for example. Here, if we tried to maximize contact by just pushing in the catheter, you'll slide away from the papillary muscle. So here it's using torque deflection to try to get better contact and stability, but contact force, force measurements might be identical while you're doing this maneuver. Further, for mapping beyond ablation, you to know how far away are you from the cord, base versus apex of the papillary muscle is very difficult fluoroscopically, perhaps impossible, but can be gauged and then you can look at ways to maximize that contact. Sam, um, can I ask you a question about that image? Yes. Um, so I think this is very helpful, visualizing the papillary apparatus on ice as well as the relation to the tip cords, et cetera. Now, what I've found, and I'll ask you to comment on this, is that often, if the origin is close to the cord or close to the tip, the putative site of origin of your arrhythmia, mapping systems can struggle with actually that complex anatomy and really identifying the site of origin. Um, and so I'll ask you to comment, do you find ice is essential for understanding that tip relationship? above and beyond the electroanatomic map. Yes, thanks, yes, absolutely. So if we're constructing an activation map and we just allow interpolation, then it's impossible to distinguish between origin, say at this site or this site. If we've done a generic kind of activation map and then realize that this is an area of interest, it's best to do a map treating the papillary muscle apparatus as a separate structure, as a separate chamber. And even then, you'll have to judge tip contact as opposed to ring electrode contact. 
because your bipolar signal might show an early activation time, but you won't be able to really clearly know if it's here or here. And since com contact is so tough to maintain, your maneuver to maintain contact at a site here is very different to here. So there, by just rotating the catheter to get the ring electrode away from the muscle and seeing if your signal remained the same, will tell you, was it the ring electrode that was dominating the uh, uh, bipolar signal or is it the tip electrode? Now we could use unipolars from both to answer the same question. But interpreting unipolars when we have multiple surrounding structures can be difficult. And that's why uh, trying to correlate with subtle movements on ice can be a game changer to know exactly where you need to maintain that contact. The other value is if you've done an ablation and then the arrhythmia doesn't go away, but it changes its morphology. If we see it's changed in such a way that it's a more inferior exit, it may be we've just ablated a connection to a more superior papillary muscle, and we need to go to the base of this papillary muscle. On the other hand, if it changes to a more superior type axis, we may have ablated the same site, but it gives us an idea that we need to map whatever this was connecting to that's more superior. Thank you very much. Um, and another question slash comment for you, because uh, this is kind of, it, it's a vexing uh, case at times to do papillary muscles, but also can be very satisfying. Um, you mentioned verifying tip contact on ice and then understanding what motion you need to improve your contact, whether it's, whether it's rotational, advancing, flexing, et cetera. Do you ever, verify your contact, even if you're not registering terribly high you know, grams of force on the tip, maybe compensate by turning up the power because you are still making contact. Do you ever make that compensation? Yeah. Device? So if this is the papillary muscle, mm -hmm. and if our contact is say in this method, so the electrode is making contact to this site, which we've already mapped to be the source of the arrhythmia. But contact force is low because that most catheters primarily are going to be sensitive to contact force in this direction, orthogonal to your catheter tip. Your contact is good. So your power titration should be as if you were seeing a very good contact force. That's a different situation to where if you are not making contact, but you're sliding across a structure and there your contact time at any given spot is going to be a fraction of your ablation lesion. Mm -hmm. And if you felt, for example, that you are safe in ablating these sites, even though they are not essential to be successful, but you want to compensate by your lower contact time in this location, that's a situation where you will turn up the power. So that's, this is kind of an example of a situation where we have side contact, but not much sliding. So here's another example where only way you could get to that clear eye on the target with visualization, but then going around the papillary muscle, and then bending your catheter back to make contact at the site. Another situation where perhaps we would not, never have recognized or successfully ablated is arrhythmias that arise on the false tendon, very similar to moderator band on the left side. About half of these structures have Purkinje tissue and about a quarter have both myocardium and Purkinje tissue in the length, across the length of the false tendon. If they're recognized and when we map on that false tendon is when we find the source of origin of the arrhythmia or perhaps in a reentrant type of fascicular tachycardia that we recognize one limb of the circuit is on this false tendon. We can maximize contact on that tendon and then try to ablate 
very, very challenging, maybe impossible to do without using intracardiac echo. Yet another location where safety of ablation is uh, improved and our own confidence of ablation is LVAD patient VTs. So several issues here is movement from active suction uh, from the LVAD, damage to the inflow cannula, recognizing where is myocardium and where is the cannula that I need to look and ablate. Once the views are established, much easier to kind of understand where we need to map, where we need to avoid while ablating these otherwise challenging arrhythmias. Another situation more in the realm of coronary, uh, of a congenital heart disease is cannula related VTs, either because they've produced an isthmus or when the surgeon has used a technique around the cannula where the ventricle is plicated and secured with sutures around the cannula, like a procedure uh, common with Rastelli uh, modifications or Rastelli procedures in some patients uh, to support right ventricle to pulmonary circulation. Here, carefully understanding what is prosthetic material, what is myocardium, correlating that with signals, and then understanding from similar views in normal hearts where to anticipate the coronary vessels can be critical to avoid sometimes catastrophic complications. Now, other times it's not so much understanding the anatomy and region for mapping, but it's really contact. And contact on the interventricular septum from retrograde access is challenging and is often underestimated with fluoroscopy alone. So for example, fluoroscopically, a catheter is prolapsed. It's not going any more towards the right we see a Purkinje-like signal, we think we're on the septum, but that could well be a papillary muscle. And to appreciate that actual visualization with ultrasound can be very valuable. Another location where contact is of value is on the aortic mitral continuity. Covered it briefly in our part one in this discussion, but appreciating the aortic annulus, the sinus of Valsalva, slight orientation change to see, are you on the uh, aortic mitral continuity? Now, one unique region in the heart where ice can be very valuable is a fairly recent uh, description of the so-called anterior crux region uh, described by my colleague, Dr. Suraj Kappa. The reason is that finding sharp potentials may not necessarily be Purkinje or conduction tissue, but unique regions of the heart where the source of arrhythmia may have some temporal and spatial delay to its exit. This produces multiple morphologies of arrhythmia from the same source and can produce these unique signals. This region, for example, this crossing in this anterior crux, mitral annulus near the coronary veins, summit region of the heart. Mm -hmm. But the key region is the left sinus of Valsalva. It's the crossing of this cross. And that's an excellent region to visualize very well with intracardiac echo. And if there's one area that a someone, a trainee getting into ventricular ablation should understand thoroughly is the left sinus of Valsalva. Are you below? Are you above? At what level do you anticipate that you're cannulating inadvertently the left main coronary artery and assessing lesion formation to know when you're done to avoid over ablation in this region? Usually we use electrograms to make that distinction, but because of the multiple structures nearby, there may be far field electrograms that still remain, but combining 
looking at near field electrograms and looking at this site can be very useful. Sometimes we don't want to be above or below, but at the commissural level itself. And that can also be done nicely by prolapsing the catheter in the commissure, watching in real time. It can be tough to know is the tip of the catheter at the commissure or is it just a shaft that you're seeing? By flushing through to see where you have the bubbles coming out with a high flow flush just transiently will help you know, yes, that's the tip that I have at the commissure. That's why I've, where I found the signal of interest and that's where I would like to ablate. So this just kind of a collection of cases, areas where we want to understand the anatomy, we want to understand how do you get the ice views to that region and how to use in real time to assess the anatomic structure relationship to where you have your catheter and contact. Thank you very much, Sam. Uh, a wonderful discussion of cross-sectional relationships, safety, um, understanding the value of ice in so many different applications in the ventricle. Um, Thank you for joining us, Sam. I appreciate the opportunity. Thanks. Thanks for organizing this. And thank you all for joining us on Heart Rhythm TV.